Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this episode, we speak to ARG member and Loughborough PhD student John Bigger about the Anarchist Group Class War standing in the 2015 UK general election. Don't forget to click subscribe and like and share this video. Well, my research is about the uh, British Anarchist Group Class War who stood candidates in the 2015 general election. And really what I'm trying to do is explain the story of the 2015 general election through a different lens. How does capitalism sustain itself? It rips everything off the ground, repackages it, and shows it to you. The 2015 general election in the UK was seen as a really boring election, and yet here was this radical group doing some really, really interesting and, and different things. And also, obviously, there are debates about whether anarchists should even be in those spaces mm. doing the things that, that they do. The interesting thing about class war is that um, obviously, it, it was quite prominent in the 1980s, or very prominent in the, in the 1980s, but there's very little scholarly material about it. So hopefully my research will kind of, um, kind of bridge that gap. So Class War uh, started in the early 1980s, um, uh, co-founded by a guy called Ian Bone, uh, who uh, was in Swansea and getting a little bit uh, frustrated about anarchist politics. Um, and specifically interested in uh, the fact that uh, pacifism was such a key feature of anarchism at the time. And he wanted to disrupt that and he started to get together with people in London uh, with the idea of getting, getting people together to kind of have a more combative style of uh, anarchist politics on the street. And uh, eventually they, they started to produce this, this newspaper. A newspaper was produced which they hit upon the, the name Class War. And essentially what they wanted to do was put working class anger back into the anarchist movement and the idea of revolution, the idea of a violent, uh, a violent overthrowing of, of the state. And crucially what they also wanted to do was shock. It, it's a group that's rarely out of the news for something or other that is going on. Um, and that is because they have a reputation now uh, amongst the press for what they did in the 1980s and, and, and beyond. Um, perhaps most particularly the poll tax riots in, in 1990, uh, where they were actually blamed for, for, for the poll tax riots. Um, but they were also the only group to come out and say, well, actually, no, we, we like the poll tax riots. We agreed with them. We, we, want, we want this kind of thing to be going on. And they were willing to actually put themselves onto television. And, and say that. So you had um, action on the streets with class war, but you also had a newspaper that was backing that up uh, with often uh, kind of uh, sensational uh, front pages, which were designed to shock, but also to be funny, if you got that sense of humour. So the newspaper famously contained um, a hos hospitalised police officer, hospitalised copper on page three to kind of mirror the uh, the, the page three girls that we see in the um, we still see unbelievably in the uh, in the right wing press. This is where I come in uh, because I I saw that class war were were standing candidates and um, and I I thought that looks like a laugh. Um, and I just just lost my job. I thought, well, you spent 13 years being a civil servant. Why don't you stand for election with class war? It seems like the logical, the logical thing to do, right? Um, so, uh, but I think what was going on prior to that was a discussion uh, within class war, uh, which was a very small group of, of people at the time, were thinking, what what do we do now? You know, we've we've reached the stage where, and and it's different now compared to. Uh, back in the uh, back in 2013, when they were having this discussion, um, it's different now because uh, the Labour Party has moved to the left, and we forget how how much politics has changed in the last few years. But back in 2013, there was this belief, uh, widespread on the left, that the Labour Party could not be turned, and that uh, politics was basically two uh, a battle between two very very similar parties. So the question arose: What can we do that's different? Uh, why not stand candidates? And the argument then came through, well, what are the arguments against standing candidates? Well, the arguments are that you shouldn't engage in, in official politics. But really, is, that, is, is class war standing a few candidates actually engaging in 
official politics to the extent that it reinforces the system. And the decision was taken that no, it doesn't. It's a publicity thing. It's a way of getting radical ideas into places where radical ideas are not normally present. So husting events being a, being a classic example. So hustings back in the Victorian era, era for example, um, when uh, not everybody had the vote, but people used to turn up to the hustings anyway just to hurl abuse. They were seen as real tests of the politicians. The politicians were expected to take the abuse and handle it with pride and with, with some kind of dignity, and that proved their worth. We've now gone to a stage in politics where uh, the people asking the questions are normally the people on the top table and not necessarily, and, and heckling is something that, uh, that is discouraged. So we brought heckling back to Hustings in a big way. Um, at the Hustings event where I stood in Croydon South, uh, every time the Conservative uh, stood up, he was being shouted at for being a murderer and for his pop for backing policies that will kill people and harm the disabled. Uh, the UKIP was shouted at for being a racist, and it was just a, a completely different uh, environment from what the assembled audience in Croydon South, which is a very conservative constituency, were expecting. We did things that were really, really different and, and unusual. That Hustings event took place on International Workers Memorial Day and I knew that I would be asked to give an opening statement and a closing statement and I knew what my opening statement was going to be, I'd written it out and I knew that I was going to link my questions, all of the answers to the questions that came up to the fact that Tory austerity is harmful to, to people but I didn't know what I was going to do um, for my closing statement and I thought well everyone's just going to really repeat what they do, that's what politicians do, so I thought well I'm not a politician I'm standing in an election, but I'm not a politician. What will I do that's different? So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do something different here. And uh, I basically, for my closing statement, stood up and invited everybody, the Tory candidate, the, uh, the Conservative audience in front of me, to join me in a minute's silence for, to remember the dead of capitalism on International Workers' Memorial Day. And because they told us to, to be quiet all the way through, they, they had to sit and observe that whole minute of silence and I didn't look behind me to see what the Tory candidate was doing but I'm, t I'm told that he was really really uncomfortable throughout it and it was a, it was a wonderful piece of theatre and that kind of thing was going on up and down the country in places where anarchists would normally just avoid it and, and okay so there's there's maybe that doesn't have a huge impact maybe that doesn't get onto the news actually one thing did get onto the news in the hustings and that was um, in the constituency of Litchfield uh, the uh, Tory candidate, Michael Fabricant, didn't turn up and he wasn't empty chaired. He was, he was, uh, there was an empty chair for him, but Class War in that constituency got a stick uh, with a wig on the top because he famously uh, wears a hairpiece. And he was just replaced by that. And it's just that, that image of making somebody look a little bit ridiculous was also another, another theme that came out in the election. <laughs>. So the anarchist movement as a whole, I think, was largely bemused and a little bit hostile to, uh, to uh, class war's um, idea. I remember before the election, uh, I was at a protest in Whitehall in London and an anarchist was giving out leaflets all about the election and, and anarchists, the pro their group's approach to the election. And I remember uh, taking a browse through it and, um, and I said, oh, I'm disappointed you've not mentioned class war and, and the fact that they're standing in the election. And, and the person just turned to me and said, I don't consider class war to be anarchists. And I think that, that says a lot. So, first of all, they might not have ever thought that class war were anarchists. But also, maybe the fact that class war was standing in an election proved to that person that they weren't anarchists. So that's a debate. That's a debate we have to have. Are we anarchists just by declaring ourselves anarchists, or are we anarchists by by how we behave and what we do? You know, there's lots of anarchists that vote. They might not. They might not talk about it, and they might not say how they vote. Or they might turn up to the ballot booth, and they might um, they might spoil their paper. They might write some obscenity on it, or draw draw a rude picture, or whatever. Actually, this idea of not voting doesn't change anything. Is what what are we going to do instead? Class war 
showed that you can do something instead. It didn't support the system. It didn't reinforce the system. The, the system hasn't become any more entrenched because of what class war did. It's still there. It's exactly the same. Um, so, you know, uh, but what, what we did do is we highlighted that you can do something unusual. You can do something different. And you can get away with it. You know, we had candidates that were on national television. You know, our, our candidate, Adam Clifford, uh, who stood in the cities of London and Westminster, was on uh, the Daily Politics show, uh, quizzed by Andrew Neil, sat next to Boris Johnson's dad, in full drag, wearing, wearing an outfit um, that was inspired by uh, the girls he knew from school, and he wanted to kind of copy, copy their image. And, and he wanted to explain his involvement in politics in, 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 in that way and wanted to express it in that way. And I think the other thing about class war is that it allows, its, uh, it, it allows the people who are involved to express themselves in quite a free way. Um, you know, I've been involved with a number of anarchist organisations and a number of organisations that run to anarchist rules. I've never been given the amount of freedom uh, in any other group. Uh, I remember very, very early on that we at that first meeting in 2014, we decided that candidates would be given as much uh, autonomy as, as they needed to do the campaign in the way that they wanted. And uh, some people just chose that to be uh, obnoxious and abusive to, to the other candidates and to, use, um, and, and to use it that way. Other people like myself, I tried to explain my views uh, in a wider kind of anarchism so I managed to get uh, get articles into the local media on my vision of anarchism and you know wanting to wanting to widen democracy because I think anarchism and democracy like you know they go hand in hand I want to see democracy to be more more direct I, I want democracy to kind of like you know a, a pure form of democracy to rule the way that we behave with each other and so I, I talked about our personal relationships and getting getting decisions made at a more local level I think we need to be careful as researchers not to kind of say oh I've done this research on you or even with you and here's my findings and now aren't you blessed uh, because it's not my role and also class war would just reject that if I took that approach, um, quite rightly, because that's just like a hierarchical thing anyway. And it's an elitist thing to think that we're in a privileged position to help the anarchist movement decide what direction it takes. Right. So uh, what I what I do for a class war is I pass back what what they have been saying, because, you know, this has been my research has been has been done through their eyes. So a lot of the stories are mine of, of what I went through during the election, but they're backed up with information from the other research participants, which include other candidates and also their supporters and people who were involved at the time. But I think the other thing that I wanted to, my thesis to, to include is, is a list of kind of, not do's and don'ts, but a list of things that radicals can learn at it for an election time if they decided ever to stand candidates. And I'm using radicals as a more broader uh, word rather than anarchists because I think this could be of interest to all sorts of groups. So, uh, so make it interesting, you know, that's one of, the, one of the things. If you're going to do something unusual and you're doing it just for the sake of it, you're doing it for a bit of fun, have a bit of fun with politics. People keep saying politics is boring. Well, I, I don't agree with that, incidentally, because I don't think we're living through boring political times. So what I found from my research participants is there, are, there is a widespread of uh, views and disagreements amongst the people who were involved with class war at the time about the campaign that they conducted. So some people said we should have had more policies. Some people said it's a mistake to have any policies at all. You should just stand on a ticket of we do not have any policies, we do not want you to vote for us. If Adam Clifford had gone on to the Andrew Neil show and said, we're encouraging people not to vote for any of us, any of our candidates, we don't want any votes, please don't vote for us. As a consistent message, that would have been really, really interesting. But really what I wanted to do was just provide some, some kind of guide to elections, if radicals stand. 
uh, the main amount of press interest is going to come from the local press. So you have to think about what messages you want to get out into the local press. They're, they're the only people who are going to care. And they will always send a photographer who wants to make you look like the story that they're telling. And the story that they're telling is an anarchist is standing in an election. So when they came to my house, I said, look, I don't really want you to film at my house, to, to take pictures at my house. Can we go somewhere else? There's a park down the road. And um, the photographer took me down to this park and, um, and I just stood there and I said, look, OK, can you take my picture then? And he said, yeah, yeah, but I just, I just want you to look more like an anarchist. And I said, well, what does an anarchist look like? And he said, oh, I don't know. Um, lean against that tree. We all talk about it as the general election of 2015, as if it's gone in the past. And the truth of the matter is it stays with you. Um, uh, indirectly today, even. I mean, we're, we're recording this in uh, 2019. And uh, I, I've been mentioned in a national newspaper today because of something that happened during that election campaign in 2015. And so it's a living thing. It hasn't gone away. It doesn't end. And that's, that's something that needs to be borne in mind. So what you do as a candidate stays with you forever. And it will, it will, it will forever, unfortunately for me, it will forever be the 2015 general election. It will never end. Um, yeah, I love it. It rips up the